dramatic session to discuss the Russian-Iranian situation. Andrei Gromyko, Russian representative, acting on orders from Moscow, awaits the decision of the council, while Hussein Allah, Iranian ambassador, bides his time to voice his complaint. The entire assembly is tense as Gromyko speaks. When he finishes, a vote is taken on whether or not the Iranian question shall be brought before the council. Gromyko opposes immediate consideration of the issue, stating that Russia and Iran have reached an understanding. Poland sides with Russia, and with the vote 9 to 2 against deferment, Andrei Gromyko, with his aide, stalks from the council chamber. This is the climax to the meeting convened to preserve world unity. The Russians leave, vowing not to participate in any discussion that concerns the Iranian question at this time. With the Russian position left unoccupied, the meeting continues while the representatives prepare to consider Iran's presentation. The Iranian delegate, after Russia's withdrawal, presents Iran's case to the Security Council. While the entire assembly weighs each word, the Iranian ambassador, Hussein Allah, denies that his country made any binding military or commercial commitments with the Soviet government. I realize that the question of whether to proceed at once or to delay is a matter for the council to decide. For my part, I am prepared, pursuant to my instructions, to proceed with the presentation of the disputes which unfortunately have divided my country and its northern neighbor. I consider it necessary to do so at the earliest opportunity. And may I say once for all that I know of no agreement or understanding, secret or otherwise, having been entered into between my government and the Soviet Union with respect to any of the matters involved in the disputes now referred to this council. Iran has suffered and is at this moment suffering from interference in its internal affairs through the intervention of Soviet agents, Soviet officials and armed forces. The presence of foreign forces in any country constitutes not only an infringement of the sovereignty but also a heavy burden on the people and an interference in their daily life. The seriousness with which the people all over the world, as well as the people of Iran, regard this state of affairs is testimony to the fact that delay in the settlement of this dispute is a threat to world peace. In Tokyo, General MacArthur welcomes a distinguished visitor from New York. Former Police Commissioner Louis J. Valentine assumes a new role, that of streamlining and modernizing Japan's police setup. His first official act is to inspect the traffic problem. Later, he'll give crime-busting the benefits of his New York technique. He'll put the nip into Nippon. The Navy draws the veil of secrecy from another wartime winner. An aerial television camera is loaded into a test plane for a series of striking tests at Anacostia. Special aerials serve the electronic camera, which is mounted in the nose of the plane. The test is on. Far from its base, the flying eye photographs and transmits its pictures of targets and objectives by one of the most compact television transmitters yet developed. The camera is aimed at a desired objective, and at Anacostia, 40 miles away in the television room, an image takes shape on the screen. The picture of a dock is brought right into the staff room. It was this kind of information that led to the sinking of several Jap ships in the Pacific. In actual war, this powerhouse could have been seen and written off by commanders as far away as 200 miles. Not even the nation's capital can hide from the flying eye. Another example of war-born genius. Happy Felton and some of his happy friends are going to give us the word. The word about dunking. Donut dunking, that is. It's strictly from etiquette and all that, so listen closely. 
First, we see Happy himself fairly serene about the world in general, and dunking in particular. However, his neighbor prefers the grab-and-bite style. Don't be afraid of the donut. It can't bite back. Of course, if you're not sure, go after it with two hands. According to the word from the Dunking Association Conclave in New York, compounding a felony is the only thing that's taboo, along with spilling on the old lady's new tablecloth. Okay, so she hasn't got a tablecloth. For the swanky soiree, Happy recommends injured innocence, or the close-to-chest sneak. This is especially apt for fugitives from household justice, introverts, and Happy Felton, who makes dunking as exciting as taking candy away from baby. Shh, somebody's looking. The Sporting Lens focuses on ping pong. The nation's devotees of paddle and ball get underway in the U.S. Table Tennis Championships at St. Nicholas Arena in New York City. All ages and both sexes are out to win national honors, and the eliminations are jammed with excitement and some trick stuff that takes my breath away. Laszlo Belak is a worthy opponent. In fact, he's dexterous, ambidextrous, and petty dexterous. If you give him an inch, he'll take a foot. Nice footwork, Laszlo. The results are spectacular and almost unbeatable. All the opposition has to do is keep banging away. And that's my cue to move on to the next table, where a couple of table tennis titans are making it tough for the poor umpire. Steady there now, old man. He's not sure who's ahead or who's who. For that matter, who is ahead? Say, keep your eye on that ball. 